Well, welcome to our first part in our series of Sweet Like Honey, The Promises of God. And today we are unpacking the promise of rest. Uh, I'm sure you would agree with, with me that this life is fueled and driven by performance. We are plagued by productivity, what we're producing. We're on the hamster wheel of life and it's going at one speed and we can't get off. Momentum and discovery have got us clocking up 300 calories per workout session or 10,000 steps in a day. And then you've got to do that for that many days. And then you can start to jump through hoops, tick boxes and climb your tears. You know, we all want to move from bronze to silver to gold. We're all driving forward, moving forward. We... Um, there's bills to pay, there's needs that, uh, and demands that are pulling on us, there's responsibilities on every single side. And in a sense, we almost feel responsible for keeping on spinning the world on its axis and, and, and spinning plates of our lives and our households and our children and our family and our workplace and our, everything around us. And if you don't already know, on those plates is spaghetti and meatballs. So it's messy, friends, it's messy. But this is a profound topic of rest, and it's a very pertinent theme, I actually even say personally to me, and outside of the fact that I love honey-themed things, in fact, funny story, this is my morning journal for 2024, and it actually says sweet like honey on it. Isn't that amazing? In fact, I even did some cutting and sticking and milk and honey for the love of bees, so it's a very pertinent theme. I love, I love it. And I love a dash of honey in my coffee as well. So there we go. But this is a theme that I've been unpacking for a while, personally. In fact, in this journal, uh, on May the 4th, no, not May the 4th be with you, but on May the 4th, I wrote in that journal, um, <laughs> I wrote in that journal, I am at my best when I am at rest. Wouldn't you agree? We are at our best, friends, when we are in his rest. Then again, on the 7th of June, I started unpacking the theme of rest again because it's something I really wanted to delve into and did a little consolidation and collection of some scriptures with the word rest in it and, uh, and wrote them out in there. I went and visited a friend uh, the other week. She was, she's a, they, her and her husband, they lead the Elam Full Gospel Church down the road, just over here, Elam. Uh, one of my nearest and dearest, such a blessing of a friend. And I went to go and visit her. She was four weeks into her six weeks recovery after having a hysterectomy. And we were talking about this topic of rest because, of course, she's not able to do anything. And we were chatting about finding that fine line between rest and rush. And that divine place of balance and how to achieve it without getting exhausted, but without not doing anything, you know? So today, as we unpack this, I trust that we are going to get an understanding of being able to master the art. In fact, I went home afterwards and I was telling Craig about my chat with her and all of that. And I said, yeah, because, you know, she's obviously having to rest and recover from her hysterectomy. So he goes, oh, is it a hysterectomy that she's having? <laughs> so I messaged her that. She thought it was hysterical. Anyways, but when we find life overwhelming, isn't it sweet to know that God offers us rest? He really does, friends. And uh, sometimes we can be so weary and burdened and we've taken on the yoke and the way of living of the world and or, or perhaps even put a self imposed, unrealistic bar on our lives that we need to jump over, and we never seem to quite ever get there. I'm sure you'd agree that living for others is crushing, and it's almost impossible. Do you know that you will never keep everyone happy all at the same time? So we, let's, let's just ditch that and let go of that um, idealistic idea. But finding that God is already pleased with us, that offers us rest straight away. Sometimes we want to seek the approval of people so much, and yet we forget about the fact that we have the approval of the one who is the lover of our souls, the one who created us. 
I would love to pray, but I don't want to pray for you just yet. I'd love you to pray with me. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to invite you just to repeat after me as we pray this over ourselves. So if you wouldn't mind, Lord, help me come to you with a willing heart and open hands that are willing to take and receive the deep soul rest that you promise through Jesus. Wonderful. Okay, we didn't end very strong, but you did great. It was awesome. We get, but I just love to pray for you. Father, won't you just come and permeate this place? Won't you just give us revelation of this? That first and foremost, your pleasure and your adoration is over us. That performance is not to earn your love. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid a price for us, that we could never pay for ourselves. And in that place, we find divine rest. Give us revelation this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Who can agree that God is a promise keeper? If he's kept his promises in the past, guess what? He's going to keep his promises into the future. What a hope that we have. Psalm 119 verse 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Who agrees with me that if you taste honey, it's something that is sweet and delicious? Of course, with this honey theme, in fact, one of the scriptures I've got stuck in the front here says, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul. And that's Proverbs 16 verse 24. So when we think of something that is sweet and tasteful, it's something that we want to return to, okay? It's, it's something we'd like to have more of. And today, I'm trusting that we would find his word and his promises in his word so sweet that we would continually return back to his word to keep finding those promises which are so trustworthy and true. So together, let's find a scripture which is a promise, which is sweet, that is a promise of rest. I, I know, and I'm sure you agree, I want to find a chapter and verse. I want to see it in black and white. And here it is. Matthew 11, verse 28 and 29. This is Jesus, a promise from Jesus himself. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. There's nothing half-hearted about that. There's not maybe, perhaps, no, you will find rest for your souls. I love the version from the message. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I, I feel like angels are humming when I read that. that. The unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Who wants to... Who wants to take up that invitation? Who wants to accept that? Do you feel hope? Do you feel like you can almost, in a sense, breathe a sigh of relief from this overworked, overwhelmed state of exhaustion uh, in the place of desperate need of good, nourishing rest for the soul? Does this go, I can, this sounds attainable. Thankfully, we find our much needed rest in Jesus. It's a sweet promise. So I know I'm throwing the word rest out a lot. Let's look at what the dictionary definition is of it. It is to cease work or movement in order to relax, sleep, or recover. Now, yes, I know, I understand, yes, you can watch a Netflix series, or you can go to a day at the spa, or you can goof off on your phone and sit and scroll. And that can almost seem like, a, in a sense, a bit of rest, okay? But we're talking about a supernatural, as it was mentioned earlier, deep soul rest. A rest not that you can just get after a good eight hours night's sleep. 
I mean, I can't even remember when last I had one of those. I, don't, I think I tried to sleep in the other day and I woke up with a headache. It just felt so foreign. <laughs> but, but it's that sweet promise of deep soul rest that supersedes a rest that just lasts for a day or a moment. It's a long-term rest as we walk with him. Do you know what rest is? It's the opposite of unrest. How often do we find ourselves in a state of unrest? That means a place of lacking peace. So we got four points today. We're going to use the acronym of the word rest. R-E-S-T. Four points. First one is relationship. Point number one, relationship. I love that in the message version where it says, keep company with me. See, it's very hard to have a relationship with someone if you're not in close proximity with them. If Craig and I lived in different bedrooms or even in different homes, we would struggle with our relationship as a husband and a wife. We've got to have proximity, okay? Relationship, there's a relay, there's a give and take, there's, it's an ongoing thing. So you perhaps might have felt that God is not close that perhaps he's distant, or maybe not even there. And I know I've said this before, it's not a him problem, it's an us problem, because he is always there, and we have all the access that we want to him whenever we want. He's not elusive or evasive. We don't have to jump through hoops in order to um, earn his love or for him to say, okay, now I'll be with you, I I will presence myself. He is there. If there's a distance, it's from our side. We need to press in. And it's echoed throughout Scripture that God wants to be with His people. I'm going to share an account from Genesis. Genesis 3, verse 8 to 9. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from him among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? This is straight after them having sinned, okay? Where was God? God was in the garden. Why? Because he wanted to have close proximity with them. Why? So he could punish them? I mean, he'd just given them an instruction. We're third chapter into Genesis. I mean, they've had, they've had this much of a relationship together. He, he gave them one job, just don't eat the fruits of the tree. And like one thing, and they did it. But he wasn't there to punish them. He was there to protect them, to preserve them, to make a plan for them. As we follow on, we find in verse 21, they're they're dodging around with their little leaves and everything. He goes and makes a plan for them by killing an animal so that he can give them skins to clothe them in. Do you know that that's the first account of bloodshed in the Bible? Blood was shed, and it was by God so that he could skin an animal, so that he could clothe his children, even after they'd sinned and turned their back on him and made a choice that was not in accordance with what he had suggested for them. The next time, no, I mean, obviously then we look in the New Testament, we see Jesus' blood shed, and we see and we hear the encouragement and how it is implored that we clothe ourselves with Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't this just a beautiful picture? This is God's heart. He never pulls off and makes us stand naked and shameful. Jesus hung on the cross naked and took all our shame so that we could have that. We wouldn't have to walk in shame. Isn't it beautiful? It's wonderful. That is the heart of the Father. So Jesus calls us in that scripture from Matthew, come to me. So directive. So Andrew, okay, no, Finley, come to me. Do it. There we go. Wonderful. Fantastic, high five. First time. Okay, great. You can sit down. Thanks. You see, but that was a directive. That was an invitation. So when you say come, there's a response. So his directive is come. And the result is that we will find rest for our weary souls, even when we feel full of shame and naked and trying to keep all our leaves positioned in place. He says, come. Come to him daily, friends. So how? And I know I've shared this before, but daily, just an opportunity in your day to find a quiet time with him, whatever suits you. For me, it works in the morning because it's quieter then, and then my attention is not divided. Perhaps that might work for you. There's a thing called the dog day, D-A-W-G, a day alone with God. 
My friend who was, who's in recovery, she messaged with me the other day and she said, no, the, her hubby was by the church and the kids were out. She was at home alone. I said, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I mean, I love my people, but they're a lot, and they just seem to be around all the time. <laughs> but anyways, and uh, another friend, uh, Nomfunda, I was messaging with her the other day, and she said, yeah, I've got the day to myself today. I was like, what even does that feel like? I do not know. <laughs> Lord, I repent for being jealous. <laughs> but, but to practice his presence, to press in, to find him, to pursue him, pursue his heart, Pursue his presence, practice his presence. It's a wonderful thing. Let him envelop us in those moments with his love and his embrace. Sit still. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Isaiah 40, verse 31. As we wait on the Lord, he will renew our strength. I don't know about you, I'm not very good at waiting. I wouldn't classify myself as impatient, but I just am a bit of a multitasker. So if I'm not doing one thing, I'd like to be doing another thing. But sometimes we just gotta wait because that's the place where our strength gets renewed. Getting in His Word. We've got the, the Bible plan as a guide. If you wanted, we're gonna have the, the next ones for the second half of the Old Testament. Um, printed out for you for the, from the month of August through to December of the Old Testament, you can jump on board. Uh, the present ones are at the New Year desk. Reading His Word. You know what happens when we read His Word? We're reminded of His promises. There are so many promises. I love to jot down promises. In fact, I think I might have even left. There we go. 1 Samuel 30 verse 6. This was on the 13th of June. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Well, if David found strength in the Lord his God, then I can find strength in the Lord my God. Also, friends, when we're in his word, we get revelation. And bear in mind, we can only reveal to others what is revelation to us. So it's a wonderful plan to get revelation so that we can be equipped to encourage others. Man, this world needs encouragement. There is some nasty people, some nasty stuff out there. There are some people going through some nasty circumstances in your workplace, and they need the love of God. They need encouragement. They need a prophetic word. They need, they need a touch from the Lord. Psalm 91, verse 1, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Lord Most High will, let's all say it together, rest in the shadow of the Almighty. But what does it take? Dwelling. Dwell, wait, position. What stops us from coming to God? What stops for us from tapping into this divine rest? Are we too busy to pursue God? Maybe there's just too much on our plate, too much spaghetti and meatballs. Perhaps we just are neglecting time with God on our priority list. So I'm going to show you an illustration, uh, just a, something that I saw, a, a handle in a sense. So this is, in fact, I bought one of these for my friend who had the hysterectomy because we're big into our diaries and all of that. And we got some strategies that we share. So this, this is a week in the life one. This is this past week. Aren't you glad this isn't your diary? And, uh, and just a little strategy, if you, know, if you want to try and order your world a little bit, sometimes I find what's really helpful is uh, if something has been done, I tick it, or if I'm really happy with it, I squiggle it out, and it's a real sense of accomplishment. If it's not going to happen, it's null and void, I put a cross through it. And if it's going to happen and needs to happen next week, there's next week, looking a lot more spacious, I put an arrow through it and then quickly write it down because if I don't in that moment, then it'll get lost into the Andrew Meteor galaxy and it's gone for good. And then I suddenly go three weeks later, oh my gosh, didn't so-and-so have a biopsy? How did it go? I need to know what their results were. And, um, you know, add it to the prayer group and stuff like that. But so often our to-do lists are filled with so many things. So a good idea, and I know I've mentioned this before about a quiet time, is to have a list on the side and you call it a brain dump. So all those things, phone the dentist, extra for and all those practicalities won't intrude on your quiet time with God. So you close that loop by writing it down so it can be out the way. But make a to-do list of all your practicalities and then 
The suggestion is, is that you tear it up. I can't do that because then it's gone. Then I'll, how will I ever be able to track it? So I will put mine aside. I will stick it into my journal with tape. The other one is then to write a priority to-do list with God. Partner with him. Lord, what's on your heart? What do you want to do today? Who can I send a WhatsApp to? Who can I pray for? Who in my life group can I pray for? Well, I'm not a life group leader. Oh, all right, I have to pray for. No, no, you're in a life group. What a privilege. What an opportunity. You're in this close, close proximity to these people so that you can partner with them and pray for them for the things. Surely you would have heard some of the burdens they're carrying or the challenges that they're facing in their life. What an honor to be able to pray for them. And you know what? What you sow, you reap. So as you pray for others, they'll start to pray for you. Isn't that a beautiful thing? As you message someone else, then you start to get messages. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And Lord, what is on you? Who could I visit today? Who's on your heart? Father, I want to reach out to those people. If, if, if I could be your hands and feet, if your hands and feet could be on the earth today, what would you do today? And do a to-do list in partnership with him. Pray for the leaders here at Grace Life. Pray for the leaders in our government. Pray for the leaders in other countries across the world. Who could it be? So we then get to partner with him, a priority list that is fueled by him. And then what happens is, is these things start to become reflective of his character and his desires. You know, we can go about our normal routines of life, but when we do this, we can have his Christ perspective superimposed over our diaries. Otherwise, if we don't prioritize that, we will just be sucked into the vortex of our own to-do list, spinning and doing everything that needs to be done. And it's futile, friends. If we're not sowing into eternity, it's not going to be here. You'll hear the very last scripture that I'm going to share. So number, okay, so the conclusion is rest requires that we actually come to God. Number two, E, embrace. So receiving this rest requires we take. It's very two very clear directives. Finley, please can you come here? Can you take this? Wonderful, there we go, fantastic. A clear directive, okay. Come here and take. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn for me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So this, we're not talking about egg yoke here. We're talking about a yoke that is put over oxen. Listen to this Bailey McBride, this quote that he writes. A yoke is a means of governing an animal and linking two or more animals for what? Greater strength. There's strength in numbers, friends. You don't want to be divisive in the community of God. There is strength in numbers. When we link arms and move together, we are a force to be reckoned with. Violent men take hold of those gates of hell. We press them back. We press them back alongside with the Lord. We have to go to third world countries to see a real yoke. And when I have seen the real thing, this is Bailey McBride in his quote, I cannot imagine willingly taking on a yoke. The idea is totally counter to my love of personal freedom. I want to do it all my way. I resist bondage, and to consider going under a yoke is a stretch that challenges me. Profound. But we are invited here to pair up with Jesus. Now, think about choosing a team. You remember when you were a captain, you were positioned as captain and you would choose your team? Of course, you're not going to choose the person with a gammy knee. I wouldn't choose Finley with a sore shoulder. You know what I'm saying? You're going to choose the, like, the, the sporty person that, you know, the, the, you want someone who's like, you know, first team material. But when we choose t- Jesus, when we choose to team with him, he's the man of the match. He's the player of the day. He is the champion. He is the winning team. And when we pair up with him, we can do nothing but win, friends. We're not even on a winning streak. We're winning into eternity. So when we decide to willingly take Christ's yoke upon us, what happens is is we're invited to lay aside our personal passions and desires. But you want to know something? The ones that lack faith 
and are futile and are limited to this life, this world, this age, that we will be rolled up in a scroll, which will be nothing in, all, in the greater scheme of eternity. The unrefined things, the worldly things that are perhaps causing us to sow into the flesh, which causes us, if we sow to the flesh, we reap destruction. They suddenly start to become peripheral and no longer take priority. Those things of status and achievements and performance, look what I can achieve, look what I can do, all those accomplishments. And then we suddenly, when we think about this and get it in perspective, we suddenly realize for many of us, maybe this is the reason why we haven't yet found true rest yet. Perhaps it's that website or that substance or that binge or that bender that we believe, that pseudo false idea that that will help us unwind. I'll find rest at the, at the bottom of that bottle. And maybe at the bottom of that packet of chips, whatever it is. But we believe a lie and it happens again and again. We think that that will bring us rest and fulfillment. And it never does. It never satisfies our needs. It keeps leaving us empty and full of a lack of peace and unrest. The, the rest that the world offers us, friends, is pseudo and counterfeit and false rest. Once you've jumped through that hoop, I'm telling you right there, there's going to be another one and another one and another one and another one and it's still not good enough a demand on us. So coming to Jesus, we suddenly realize that he is the only one that can truly promise and deliver true rest for our weary souls. Coming to him is the first step. That's step number one. But then we must take the decision to make the trade. Our yoke, maybe the yoke that we put on ourselves of demand and what we need to do and what needs to be done, if we're so hard on ourselves, that we even stick it on our spouse. Come, do this. And they, they're always hopping to it because we're so dominant, because we think if that's what's being done, there's going to be peace and there's going to be rest. And it never, it never culminates. What can we do? We trade it. We trade our yoke for his yoke, which results in greater strength. We're in the winning team. Do you feel like you've been carrying a yoke that's been weighing you down? What was weighing you down? Maybe it's your etiquini bill. Maybe it's your finances, marriage, your job, your kids, a health issue, an addiction. Maybe something that's weighing you down is the very fact that you feel like you cannot earn God's approval. When we take on his yoke, we realize the price that was paid for our lives. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run, not limp, not peg leg, run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Friends, there's a race marked out for us for souls to be saved. Ain't no space for peg legs. We got to keep moving. We got to be about the things of the king and his kingdom and his, the beautifying of his bride. There are far too many people dying and going, going to hell for us to be hey, having issues. Take a tissue for your issue and get it resolved and move on. Move on. We got to keep moving on. We got to run with perseverance, running, throwing off everything that counteracts us from experiencing or keeping us from his rest. We're free from our works, friends, and performance of trying to earn God's approval and love. It's a, that is a misconception if you think you've got to earn God's approval and his love. When we come, we lay it all down and we lift up his yoke. Matthew 11 verse 30 says this, again, Jesus saying, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you, Lord. He can provide it if we're willing to take it. Point number two, embrace it. You know what, friends, we'll perform harder and produce more for the Lord when we're not doing it for his approval, but from his approval. Knowing his approval of us will make us do it even more as sons and daughters of the King. We're not doing things to earn his love. We have his love, and that is what fuels us. 
We don't do it for him. We do it with him. We're yoked with him, friends. Any opportunity, whether it's being a car guard, washing dishes, cleaning the toilets, serving, whatever it is, any job, we do it with him. We're yoked with him. And why? Because Christ's love compels us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. Number three, study. Third directive, the rest we require needs that we learn. He says, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. Sometimes we don't think we need teaching, friends. We're too clever, okay? We think we're too big for our boots. We're like adult teenagers, okay? We forget that he uses the foolish to confound the wise, and we get proud in our own ability and accomplishments and achievements. And so all of a sudden, we can no longer spin the world on its axis and keep all those plates going with their spaghetti and meatballs. And then we end up feeling like a failure. And when everything does come crashing down and the, wor- the world is rolling down the driveway like a stray soccer ball and there's spaghetti and meatballs all across the wall and the plates are on the floor, I can promise you now, We won't get any sympathy, and it's not sympathy we need, friends. It's his divine strength, which is found in rest. We gotta get yoked, gotta get yoked. And there, after everything comes crashing down, is the savior of our souls, standing with his arms wide open, not saying I told you so. I was waiting until you were gonna just blow everything, and then you'd come to me, then you'd come running. No, but patience and gentle, and humble, not with an ounce of arrogance, nothing, saying, let me teach you. Come, let's, let's get it right together. Here, let me clothe you with skins. Replace those leaves with some skin. Here, let me pay a price for you. The beautiful thing about God is that he wants to go on the journey of life with us. The unforced rhythms of grace. He wants to teach us. It's like a dance so that we could understand. He wants to be there right by us every step of the way. A relationship. It's promised in the Old Testament. Here's here's one example from Joshua 1 verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Imagine taking that scripture alone and using it as a promise every single day. Lord God, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Jesus, that as it says in Joshua 1 verse 9, that you will be with me wherever I go. Thank you for your presence today in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't that phenomenal? Isn't that amazing? Point number four, trust. So it was take, no, come, no, where were we? Rest, R E. S-T, study and trust. It's gonna take trust to rest in him, friends, because we're so used to producing. It's ingrained in us, but it's gonna release control, relinquish control, let go, let God. In order to find rest, it is impossible by our own achievements, but by Christ's accomplishments. We don't have to live for approval addiction, people pleasing. We live to please God as a reciprocation of his pleasure over us. Isn't that wonderful? Hebrews 4, verse 9 to 11. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works. Those works are trying to earn his approval, earn something that was already paid for at the cross, just as God did from his Therefore, let us make every effort to enter that rest. There's different translations. They say, so let us do our best to enter that rest. This is my favorite. Let us therefore strive. Have you ever strived for something? Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Make every effort. There's another translation. I think they're up there. Yes, there they are. Be diligent to enter that rest. Let us labor, therefore, to enter that rest, as the King James Version says. Friends, what is holding you back? Is it performance? Is it perfectionism? Is it pride? What keeps you coming from Jesus to receive this divine rest and deep, soulful contentment in your life? Or is it projection? of just being so worried about what other people should be doing so you actually don't even come into a place of rest because you're so worried about if what everyone else is doing and what they shouldn't be doing or what they should be doing. No, it's about us and him, friends. 
He's marked out a race for each one of us. Can I invite you to, to join me in standing, please? There is a divine rest that is for us, a deep, soulful contentment for our lives. So perhaps today you need to be taking up that invitation to come to him, to take that step of trading yokes, leaving yours at the cross and taking on his so that you can have greater strength for this life. Friends, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be prepared. None of us will ever be perfect and none of us will ever be prepared. If you do think that, I'm afraid I'm I'm gonna burst your bubble. It's an illusion. We will never arrive in this life. That's why we are always dependent on his beautiful grace. We just have to be willing. That's the start of the process of peace. And we can grab hold of that promise today. So I wanna read a final promise to you. Revelation 21 verse one to three says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and all the futility of all the things that we ran around trying to produce on the hamster wheel of life, they're gonna be gone, friends. If they weren't for eternity, and of course there are things that we have to do. There are things, but perhaps there are other things that we're doing that are absolutely futile. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. That is the representation of us. Well done for being here today to be beautified, to beautifying others. It's exquisite, friends. It's a delight. It's a fragrance in his nostrils. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. Proximity, the promise of the fact that he wants to be with us. He wants to be as close to you as you'll let him be, friends. And nothing can scare him. There is nothing in your closet that could freak him out, that would deter him, that he would turn away and walk away. He pursues the pain. He presses in. So I want to invite you, if you want to, I'd love to pray for you. So if that's you, and you want to take up this invitation of of receiving um, the rest of God, where you are coming, this relationship, where you want to embrace His yoke, where you say, Lord, help me get an understanding so I can study your words, so I can learn from you, so I can walk with you in the cool of the day and have an understanding and trust you. If that's you, I want to invite you to join me. My hand is up as I just pray over over us today. So Jesus, we want to thank you for this divine invitation that you have extended to us in the book of Matthew. We want to say thank you that you invite us, that you tell us to come. That alone in itself, warts and all, you say come. All our failures, even all our accomplishments, all our certificates on the walls, or even perhaps lack thereof, maybe all our failures, you say, come. You invite us to take your your burden, your yoke. We put ours down today. We wanna repent for having held on to ours for so long with white knuckled hands, with the sweat of our brow as we clung onto those things which have just offered futile unrest, lack of peace within our souls. And we wanna say, we wanna take your yoke and experience that greater strength. And Father, won't you, won't you help reveal to us that we could learn from you, that we would be good students and in turn trust you. I want to thank you. Holy Spirit, I just pray for a divine release of tangible rest right now into any restless souls in this place. I want to thank you that you are permeating and you're moving through this place. If there is anyone here that ever finds himself in a place of anxiety, turmoil, if that's you, say, Jesus, that's me. Holy Spirit, come and do a work in me. If you find yourself in absolute turmoil where you feel knotted up inside, sometimes you don't even know what to do. You feel an anxiety of, I should be doing something. He's releasing you of it right now. Holy Spirit, go and permeate in those, in those souls, bringing a deep soul rest right now. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus. I know we went a bit over time, but I want to say thank you for uh, just yeah, being so attentive. Dawn preached so well because you listened so well. And uh, that's a phenomenal, that's, this is an amazing thing, the promise of rest. Interesting that Hebrews chapter 4 says that God swore on oath in his anger that we would never enter his rest without faith. This is to the, the, obviously uh, Moses or the book of Hebrews talking about what happened with Moses in the desert. But the Lord hasn't changed his, 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 the way. Of course, we are under grace now as a, in the new covenant. But he said, he said, without faith, you cannot enter my rest. Without actually trusting me and walking in my ways, you can't enter my rest. You can think you are and you can con people that you are, but you're actually not. Amen? So I want to encourage you. Great word, babe. Hold on to that. Don't let that go. Keep on pressing. Next week, the promise of grace.